Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks. Welcome to my YouTube channel, The History Squad. Now, today's video has actually been requested by a couple of my patrons over the last uh, 12 months here. It's about the famous or infamous Englishman, John Hawkwood, the boy from Essex who went from Bowman to captain of Bowman to knight and to lead one of the greatest free companies of mercenaries the world has ever known. It is said that he, together with his band of merry men, conquered half of Italy. John Hawkwood, what a character, a favorite of mine for sure, because he was a common bowman. He was born 1326, Essex. So he's an Essex lad. Good on you. He was born to a tanner. Now, a tanner, he kind of says, you know, the leather worker, that kind of thing. Not quite true. It looks like he owned the tannery and the land around it. So John Hawkwood has a step up. He's apprenticed when he gets a little bit older to a tailor in London. So he moves to the big city where archery is a bit of a religion. He must have joined a group. He's very good because he ends up at the Battle of Cressy, 1346. Was it John Hawkwood who stood over the young 16-year-old Prince of Wales when he'd been knocked down? Was it John Hawkwood who pushed the French back, allowing the Prince of Wales to stand up? Well, 10 years later, Battle of Poitiers, in the same division of the Prince of Wales, John Hawkwood is a captain of bowmen, and after the battle, he is actually knighted. Two versions, one is he was knighted by De Vere himself, the Earl of Oxford, the other by the Prince of Wales. This is the stuff of legend, but actually he was there and he did fight in these battles. Now, another little thing was he may have been the subject of Geoffrey Chaucer, the famous author of the time, the Canterbury Tales. He may have been the subject for the knight's tale. And it makes sense when you look, you know, he's a commoner and up he comes and ends up as a knight. I love this. Now, all was going well. Soldiering was great until the Treaty of Brittany, 8th of May, 1360. Bang, the war is over. He's got a choice. He can follow the Prince of Wales division, but he doesn't. He joins the Free Company. You see, at that time, so many archers, bowmen had gone back to England. But it's an uncertain future, isn't it? So he decides to join one of these great free companies and begin his exploits over in the east of France. So Hawkwood finds himself in joint control with a German called Sturz of the Great White Company. Thousands upon thousands of mercenaries. These men were professional seasoned soldiers. Englishmen, there will be Frenchmen, Breton, Italians, and a large contingent of German. So they had crossbowmen, longbowmen. Now there's an interesting thing, when you regard or refer to some of these soldiers, they will say, oh yeah, there were 20 lances, or there was a lance. A lance is three men. You have the commander with his lance, you have a mounted bowman, and next to him, his squire. In combat, the squire takes the horses away, he will make sure they're secure. Meanwhile, the commander with his lance and his bowmen move forward. The squire will then come in to the back of the nobleman here and he will support him with his lance and in the fighting. You put all of these little units together in great companies, they work incredibly well. Note that they fight on foot, but of course they have their horses, so when required, they can patrol or they can charge on horse. So that's a lance, basically three men working together. That's your basic unit. So this unit of men, this massive, massive company, the White Company, they're called the White Company because they used to burnish their armour bright. These men had pride. And when you read about them, there's quite something here. John Hawkwood, he loved his men. He respected them and he spoke to them. He was one of these men who ensured that if a man was killed, his body was taken care of. If his men survived the battle, then dividends were shared equally. His men loved him. John Hawkwood, what a guy. But there was one guy who didn't like him, and that's Pope Innocent VI. He hated them because in their locust stripping of the land, they were blocking any revenue back to the Pope. The Pope in Avignon in France was saving up to move to Rome, but he couldn't because this white company 
had blocked all of his revenue. So he excommunicated them. Their souls will be damned. I don't think it made much of a dent on these soldiers. Let's face it, these men were butchers. But eventually there was a peace agreement made and the Pope come up with an idea how to lessen the strength of this white company. Divide it. Half can fight in Spain and the other half can go and fight in Italy. Hawkwood, with his white company, together with Sturt, they choose to go and fight in northern Italy. And there begins one heck of a tale. So John Hawkwood finds himself with his white company in northern Italy fighting for various factions in the Pisan Florentine War. Eventually, he fights under Bernabo Visconti, the Lord of Milan, a powerful magnate. In fact, he gets on so well that he marries his daughter, Donina Visconti, uh, 1357. They had four children. When he married, he's approaching middle age. She's only 17. And you kind of go, oh, yeah, yeah. But there's an interesting thing here. They must have fallen in love because she becomes the one constant in his life. He can actually confide in her. She advises him. To me, this is quite well because there you have this battle-hardened man who is, without a doubt, a ruthless killer. And yet, with his young wife, he finds that confidant. Now, he goes on a great raid into Tuscany and it becomes part of what's called the War of the Eight Saints. You've got the new Pope, Gregory XI is involved, different states and different factions all have their own saints so it's known as the War of the Eight Saints. But all of this time it's understood that Hawkwood was actually working as well for Edward III of England. He stayed loyal to the crown. Some say he was actually his agent in Italy. John Hawkwood had a, a reputation for being as crafty as a fox, cunning. Uh, some called him the wolf. In fact, interestingly, in uh, Italy, they couldn't pronounce his name, Hawkwood. Giovanni is John, but they couldn't pronounce Hawkwood. So he was simply called John Sharp. Bernard Cornwall will know that name, Sharp. Anyway, Battle of San Miniato, 1368. This shows you just how forward-thinking and how crafty as a fox, cunning as a fox, John Hawkwood really was. He knew that he could not stop the enemy army. It was massive, all mounted on horses. So he pays local children, hundreds of them, to stand in the way of the enemy army. The kids have got helmets, you know, spears and all this kind of thing, flags. They look like they are an army from a distance. The enemy actually approach, so they are ordered then to slowly turn around and retreat. The enemy take the bait and they charge full tilt. Can you imagine those kids there? All of a sudden they're going, this is so much fun. You know, I've got a couple of ducats here, I've gone rich, you know, and all of a sudden there's thousands of men with lances on horses tearing towards them. They run for their lives, screaming as they go. But what they don't know is they're running on soft ground. And as the enemy get closer and closer, all of a sudden their horses sink in the mud and the army is stopped. Hawkwood now can do one of two things. He can either leave or he can turn on his enemy. But that is a whole different story. This is just one instance that shows how crafty that man could be. If you take the year 1376, 1377, Northern Italy was ravaged by the plague. It really did get stuck in. Meanwhile, in the town of Cassina, there'd been a bit of a rebellion against uh, some of the mercenary soldiers. Bretons, I understand, their blood had been spilt. Pope Gregory was furious because it's against his troops. He gets so angry that he orders John Hawkwood to the town. And Hawkwood basically says, you want me to yeah, put the, the rebellion down? And the Pope says, no, I want every man, woman and child butchered. Hawkwood kind of questions this, but he is ordered. He wants the town leveled. He wants all the people dead. Hawkwood apparently takes up position outside the town. He commands what's going on on the outside. The troops that are in the inside, from what I can tell, 
mainly Germans and Bretons. On the outside, you have the English troops. Doors are locked and they go to work. And they massacre up to 6,000 innocent people. This is the power of the Pope who is moving from Avignon in France to Rome. This is one of the dark sides of these mercenary bands. Can you imagine that? 6,000 men, women and children. The horrors that were committed at that time are disgraceful. But what gets me, it was in the name of the Pope. One of the greatest battles in Italy that uh, John Hawkwood fought in with his free company was the Battle of Castanero, 11th of March, 1387. Wow, what a victory. He was as cunning as a fox. He knew that his army was well outnumbered. The enemy, uh, the Veronese, had 16,000 men. Hawkwood's army up to just maybe just over 9,000. But there were... 12,000 in reserve of the Veronese army. Now this was a mixture, this reserve, it could have been peasants as well as professional soldiers. However, John Hawkwood's army is outnumbered. So he chooses the battlefield. He falls back, he brings the Veronese in and there is a canal across their path. This canal is not very wide and it's been filled with fascines, wooden bundles. His army is formed up on the one side but his right flank is anchored in the woods. There are some deep woods around this right area where Hawkwood is going to place his cavalry. But he bluffs it. In the center of his army is John Hawkwood's coat of arms. His standard is flying, giving everybody the opinion that Hawkwood is leading his troops from the center. The battle is engaged. Men are fighting for their lives. Now here, Hawkwood would have had longbowmen, crossbowmen, he would have had men with lances, pikes, as well as your normal assortment of weapons. Now as the battle really does get stuck in, there is a fire arrow shot from the woods in an arc across the battlefield. As soon as the arrow is seen, Hawkwood's standard is thrown to the ground. It's a bluff. John Hawkwood now, with his standard mounted on a lance, charges out of the woods with his cavalry smashing into the flank and then around to the rear of the Veronese army. These men at the back now surge forward, whilst his own army, that's Hawkwood's army, now advance over the canal, trapping the Veronese army. It's going to be crushed. Meanwhile, Veronese cavalry, separated from their army, have it on their toes and run away. They will be pursued and there will be casualties. The army of the Veronese is now crushed. Do you know, they lost over 700 dead, 800 wounded, 4,000 captured. But there's a part of this little story that's often missed. You see, the Veronese with their peasant army at the back, their reserve, it didn't run away and it refused to surrender. What courage, because then they were dealt with. Many of them fell to the blade and then some of them surrendered. Brave fellows, they were just ordinary people. And just a note here, Hawkwood's army suffered light casualties. Whereas I said, the enemy it was quite severe. It was a complete victory. Can you imagine you're advancing forward and all of a sudden you're hit from the back and then the army in front of you begin to advance. So you are literally being crushed from both sides. This was said to be John Hawkwood's greatest victory. And I must admit, it was quite something because he thought it all out first. He drew the enemy onto his battlefield, the battlefield of his choosing, and he set the trap. So when you look at John Hawkwood, the man, 50 years he was a soldier, 40 of which were in Italy. This was, wow, what a guy. And he was paid in sometimes an absolute fortune in gold florins, or when the Pope couldn't pay for his services, John Hawkwood was given land and property, all that kind of thing. But of course, Hawkwood had to pay his men. And it's quite amazing that uh, he did take care of them. But there's a twist in the tale here. I have it on good authority that John Hawkwood would amass so much money and then send it, smuggle it back to Essex. He always intended that at the very end of his life, he would move himself and his family away from Florence 
back to Essex. His last campaigns were 1390 to 1392. Uh, he ended up in Milanese territory and performing a great feat of arms. He managed to extract an entire army from the path of the Milanese who could have destroyed this army. And this great retreat saved his army. It's such a shame though, because John wanted to go home. He was old now, in his 70s. It's time for him to go back to Essex. And from what I've read, he was putting his affairs in order when he died, 17th of March, 1394. So that Essex boy would never get home. Or did he? We don't know for sure if he's buried in Florence or if he's buried back in Essex. There are lots of legends and rumours. John Hawkwood, in my opinion, one of the greatest English bowmen that ever lived. Well, I hope you enjoyed my little video there. Do you know, we've only touched lightly, really, over the 50 years of John Hawkwood serving as a soldier's time. So if you're interested, have a read. There are some great books out there, some incredible information. And if ever you go to Firenze, Florence, in northern Italy, that's where he ended up. There's lots about John Hawkwood in Firenze. So if you did enjoy my video, then like, share and subscribe. And don't forget to turn on the all notification buttons so you know what's coming on down the line because we have got such a mixture of history videos for you to see. Now, before I go, quick mention for some of my Patreon members. Hey guys, thanks a million. Mike Benny, Chase Dixon and 1660. Thanks a million guys and thanks to everyone else. Bye for now.